Would you say a few words to the American people? Just a moment, please. Who are you? I'm Miss Manchester's ambassador. Yes, sir. For the fingerprinting. Excuse me. Your right hand, please, sir. Yes. Your Majesty, won't you say a few words to the American people? I am deeply moved by your warm friendship and hospitality. This big-hearted nation has already demonstrated its noble generosity to those who come to seek a refuge from tyranny. Released in 1957, A King in New York was Chaplin's penultimate film. Most importantly, it was the great filmmaker's last screen performance. The story deals with the American exile of a European monarch who has barely escaped a revolution, only to be caught in the world of commercials and television and involved in the McCarthyist witch hunts. For Chaplin, it was a way to portray his vision on the world, a bitterly satiric vision, both autobiographical and prophetic. Tonight, I want the light and the frivolous. I want to see the town. Steady, sir, steady. Ah, Chamier, if you knew what it means to breathe this free air, this wonderful, wonderful America, its youth, its genius, its vitality, the glamour of it all, New York. America. The film was poorly received because many saw it as being nothing more than Chaplin settling scores with America. When he made A King in New York, Chaplin was 67. He was the richest and most famous artist in the world, an Englishman who remembered going to America some 40 years before. I think New York in this film is representational. It's not just representational as New York, but it's representational in terms of America as an empire, in a way. What he wants is to make a statement about the essence of America and about and th via New York City. So, and this he does so beautifully because the film is about, I don't know, he, he goes on this whole, he flees his country, he comes to New York with what the press call, you know, the press asks him, where's the loot? You know, where's all the money that you stole from your country? And he finds out that it's been stolen from him already. Like the money preceded him in New York and is already gone. And this is very much a representation to me of New York because New York is not a city where there are any uh, natural resources. It was a, a trading post initially where now is Wall Street. And it's always been about conning people out of their money and about money. New York is about money. Your question, please. And everything in this film shows how crass, in a way, American culture is. Documents were transferred out of the reach of revolutionary thieves and cutthroats. Where are they? And of course, the crass commercialization, commercialism everywhere you look in America. He even does something very, something I find really brilliant. His first night when the king is in America, he hasn't realized that all his money is gone yet. And they go out on the town, you know, and this is where they, uh, they see rock and roll. And, you know, this is in the 50s, so rock and roll is a, is a, you know, mass audience, you know, cultural phenomenon in America. But the way he represents it in the film is really phony rock and roll. It's already been commercialized. It's almost like he was foreseeing the present with music like the Backstreet Boys or Britney Spears or this kind of music that's devoid of any originality but the form of it is foisted on you, is pushed on you in a commercial way. And then there's the incredible sequence when they're at the movies. And this is where, yeah, where the shootout there, they're watching this gigantic cinemascope screen. It's just hilarious. But even, even the content of these trailers is very insightful in terms of what American culture 
was then and continues to be, you know. It, in so many ways, politically, too, this film is kind of shocking in how it predicts the future of American culture. Hello, honey. Are you nervous, bothered, and upset? Take off your clothes. Relax. With a bottle of Whitbread's beer, it'll give you pep and give you cheer. Remember, Whitbread's beer. It's a constant barrage of imagery that's supposed to sell something to you. And if you go down to Times Square now, certainly it's the same thing. They're just now moving gigantic video billboards and flashing lights and almost naked girls. And it's the same thing, but just updated. So it hasn't changed really at all much. It's just, in a way, just gotten a little scarier, more intense. The stakes are higher. <laughs> To understand how A King in New York originated, we have to go back to 1952. Charlie Chaplin returned to his hometown, London, like the king of the world for the premiere of Limelight. He was welcomed as a national hero and received adulation from the crowds. But behind the official smile, the king's anxiety was evident. He had just been set upon by the American government and immigration services, who announced they were rescinding his re-entry visa to the United States. That day, Chaplin found himself an unwilling exile. On the train heading for London, the city where he was born 63 years ago, Charlie shows his wife some of the places he knew as a child, the humble, poor places where he was reared, and about which his son Michael has only heard. These are days of turmoil and strife and bitterness, he said upon his arrival. This is not the day of great artists. This is the day of politics. I do not want to create any revolution. All I want to do is create a few more films. I've never been political. I have no political convictions. I'm an individualist, and I believe in liberty. It's important to remember that Chaplin had never applied for American citizenship and that he had just spent a rather difficult 10 years in the United States. Monsieur Verdoux had been a failure. He was taken to task for some sarcastic declarations about the country that had made him rich. He was suspected of concealing income from the Internal Revenue Service and of being a member of the Communist Party. His stay in London invigorated Chaplin. The accusations of the Attorney General, James McGranary, under pressure from McCarthyites, forced him to burn all his bridges with America. In November, during a lightning trip to California, his wife Una liquidated the Chaplin assets and recovered their fortune. She discovered that the FBI was out to get them, relentlessly questioning all the people who had worked for him. The Chaplin family arrived in Switzerland late in 1952 and moved into a villa in Vevey a month later. Here, Chaplin seemed to find the calm and serenity he had been deprived of in recent years. Spring's the time for making love. He quickly reorganized his activities. Feeling fairly isolated, he encouraged his young friend Jerry Epstein, who had been his assistant on Limelight, to join him in Europe. The very morning of his arrival, Chaplin, visibly shaken, informed him of the execution of the Rosenbergs. One of the greatest peacetime spy dramas in the nation's history reaches its climax as Julius Rosenberg and Morton Sobel, convicted of revealing atomic secrets to the Russians, enter the federal building in New York to hear their doom. It is a stern jurist they face in Judge Irving Kaufman. He sentenced both Rosenbergs to death in the electric chair and while appeals to the highest courts are planned, it certainly appears that the spies are headed along a one-way street. Chaplin remained deeply affected by his problems with the United States. His studio and his home in Beverly Hills were sold off and, as a final insult, Una handed in her passport and gave up her American citizenship. 
It was here, in this library, that Chaplin would write his film scores and dictate his last screenplays. One day, Michael, her seven-year-old son, homesick for their golden life in California, came into Chaplin's study singing God Bless America. Jerry remembered how Chaplin began to scream for Una to get the boy out of there. His creative juices were stirring again. To work is to live, and I want to live. Chaplin sought a way of bringing back his tramp character in the body of an old man. He quickly gave up the idea, realizing that what made his tramp work as a character was his walk, his agility, his ability to escape danger through acrobatics. No, he had to find a new character. He briefly entertained the idea of reviving Verdu. Jerry and Una objected immediately. Well then, he said, how about a king? In fact, he had recently met some deposed monarchs at a local reception. One thing intrigued him, the way these kings had of escaping revolutions. For days afterwards, Jerry recalled, we sat on the lawn and I took notes as he improvised ideas and sequences. Where they were leading, he did not know, but he soon had an opening sequence. Chaplin now had the two main elements of his film, the opening scene and the main character. All he had to do now was to put him through trials and tribulations, a good deal of them, which he would overcome one after the other for 90 minutes. Where is he? He's gone! Where? To the treasury! This satiric comedy was entirely set in the United States. Chaplin was highly excited. Still, the screenplay would be two years in the writing. He decided to shoot in London, fairly nervous about working without his old crew. He personally financed the film, and Jerry put the production together. The casting got underway. For the lead female role, he first considered his son Sidney's girlfriend, Kay Kendall. But in the end, Dawn Adams, a British actress engaged to Prince Vittorio Massimo, got the part. A more delicate bit of casting was that of the child who would become the heart of the picture. After a number of screen tests, he cast his son, Michael. Shooting got underway in the spring, during a cold wave, in the utmost secrecy. It was a closed set production and off limits to the press. Chaplin felt uneasy, like a foreigner, far from the friendly working relationships he had established in his Hollywood studio. Back there, the world had been at his feet. If he had a last-minute idea of using a string of sausages or the Eiffel Tower for a gag, he did it immediately. But at Shepperton Studios, he was told it was impossible, that it wasn't provided for in the props list. His relationship with the director of photography, Georges Perinal, was fraught with tension. He criticized Perinal for taking too much time to light scenes. Turn on all the lights, he would order him. I have to give a performance. I don't give a goddamn about your artistic effects. It's a comedy. We need light. It's about telling the story, not about showing off a technique ever for him. So, and the essence of all, all of his camera positions or, or the style of the film or how much cutting there is really always seems to just be there to advance the story. There's a sequence where the king and his ambassador, they're peeking through a keyhole into the next room where they see this naked girl in the bathtub and she turns out to be an advertising specialist, right? But even when they're looking through the keyhole, she looks directly at them as though she's already on TV, you know? And we don't know anything about her yet, but uh, yeah, this, this eye contact is very Chaplin-esque, you know, very astute and stylistically brilliant. It made me laugh out loud. 
Chaplin wrapped his film in 10 weeks, a record in his production of feature films. He edited the film in Paris. His one-time associates at United Artists, already reticent upon reading the script, arrived. Shocked by the negative vision of America, they refused to distribute it. A King in New York would only be released in the United States 15 years later, shortened by 10 minutes. Chaplin personally conducted the recording of his music. Certainly Chaplin's films are musical in rhythm, and he is in a sense a dancer as well, so he understands the rhythm even of a human body moving across a, through a room. But what's really, really impressive to me is the fact, the simple fact that he created the music himself. You know, this is, he is truly, maybe the first truly independent master of cinema because he has control over everything in his films. The premiere was held in London on September 12, 1957. Reacting to the lukewarm reception of audiences in the press, he said, My picture isn't political. The film is a satire. This is my most rebellious film. I refuse to be part of this dying civilization they talk about. This film is political. There's no way you can say it's not. And uh, in, in a very beautiful way, because it is very funny and it is a, a very interesting story uh, from many aspects, very human story. But he fills it with politics. The committee cites this witness for contempt of Congress. That's very unsportsmanlike on your part. I almost want to jump up and cheer when he sprays the house on un-American activities with a big fire hose, I mean. So he even is, in a way, a warrior, a comedic warrior um, and provocateur with this film. And this young boy, played by Michael Chaplin in the film, he's talking about the monopoly of power as the menace of freedom and, you know, he, but the, and he mentions, he also predicts all this monopolization and corporatization. He, the kid even mentions uh, chain stores and the automobile industry and, you know, he's very, very, this is really beautiful, the things he says. Of course, Chaplin's also making fun of him by his way of saying it, but really the heart of the film is in, you know, for me politically is in this character. Ah, very interesting. This, Your Majesty, is Rupert, our young editor. How do you do, Rupert? How do you do? Sit down. And what's that you're reading? Karl Marx. Surely you're not a communist. Do I have to be a communist to read Karl Marx? Rupert! That's a valid answer. Well, if you're not a communist, what are you? Nothing. Nothing? I dislike all forms of government. But somebody must rule. And I don't like the word rule. Well, if we don't like the word rule, let's call it leadership. Leadership in government is political power, and political power is an official form of antagonizing the people. They have become the weapons of political despot. Yes, ma'am, may and I... And if you don't think as they think, you're deprived of your passport. Will you allow me to... To leave a country is like breaking out of jail. Yes, And but... to enter a country is like going through the eye of a needle. But will... Am I free to travel? Of course you're free to travel. Only with a passport. Will you allow me to say something? Only with a passport. And free speech, does that exist? No, you've got it all. And free enterprise. We were talking of passports. Today, it's all monopoly. All right. Now, will you... Can I go me? into the automobile business and compete with the auto trust? If I can get in a word... Not a chance. Can I go into the grocery business and compete with the chain stores? Will you shut up? Not a chance. Originally, he wanted to give me the role of the young boy you see in the background blowing peas at him. In the end, he worked with me a bit and decided to give me the other, more important role. It was great for me. Today, man has too much power. The Roman Empire collapsed with the assassination of Caesar. And why? Because of too much power. Feudalism blew up with the French Revolution. And why? Because of too much power. And today, the whole world will blow up. 
Je comprenais pas vraiment. I really didn't understand what it was I was reciting, but he never really explained it to me. He told me what tone of voice to use, the feelings to put into it. He acted out the role himself, and I mostly imitated him. That's how I did it. My father was behind me at every moment of the shooting. He really supported me. He directed me in everything I did. I was so happy to have this relationship with him. Working with him was terrific. I'd never had anything like it before, or even after. It was a special moment that we spent together. Don't you remember me? Say I do, the most obnoxious brat I've ever met. He was a pretty difficult father, so this was really something unique. He was a great comedian, a genius. I can't say he was a perfect father, but you can't do everything. <laughs> someone here to see you. Hello, Rupert. Unlike Chaplin's sentimental tendencies in some of his films, this film completely evades that and for me has an incredibly sad, not sentimentally sad wow. ending where this young boy is, well, it's a, a reference to the Rosenbergs, but this kid is broken by the authorities. His spirit is broken, he is forced to name names in order to free his parents from prison. And he's very ashamed. Come, come, Rupert. I thought we were all over this. And I find that really tragic, because what he stood for was, was really all the beautiful things. I mean, I, I, I agree with what he spouts out all the time, so that may be subjective, I don't know, but that makes it a tragedy for me, the film. Poor little fellow, I think a trip would do him good. But of course, there are complications. Well, let's hope they'll soon be over. I hope so too, sir. We all he really, it is his most rebellious film and, and has the most sting to, to it in a way, the most venom in it, you know, in what, in, in the message he's leaving. the weeping willows and I'm stepping through plate windows on account of you he had a love-hate relationship with America but he would always say he couldn't really hold a grudge against America because it was a country that had given him everything he was an anarchist, an outsider. The character he created was that of an outsider. But there was still something inside him that was deeply bourgeois. He was a very complex man. Every moment, every hour, leave me now. When he would work on his terrace, he was always fighting off the crows that came to make holes on the grass to find white worms. And he came up with a system with a mirror to reflect sunlight into the birds' eyes so they would fly away and leave his lawn alone. <laughs> 